Most of Capra's colleagues have resisted his matchmaking between science and mystical traditions, but he's not the first modern scientist to have made such a connection. That distinction belongs to a Danish physicist whose centenary was celebrated in Copenhagen in October last year at a symposium attended by 400 leading physicists from all over the world. The institute he founded in 1920 is an international meeting place for physicists. His name was Niels Bohr. Together with other physicists, Niels Bohr opened up the world of subatomic particles, a world in which all sorts of familiar concepts, such as location, velocity, mass, and cause and effect, were found to lose their established validity. To make sense of such a conceptual upheaval, Bohr turned to other ways of looking at nature. He arrived at a view similar to that of a Hindu, a Taoist, or a Buddhist. He wrote, if we look for a parallel to the lessons of atomic theory, we must turn to those kinds of epistemological problems with which the Buddha and Lao Tzu have already been confronted. In 1947, Niels Bohr was raised to the Danish peerage. For his coat of arms, he chose the Chinese yin-yang symbol because it embodies a complementary relationship between two opposites. He wanted to express his sense of the harmony between Eastern wisdom and modern physics. But as a young physicist, Bohr had followed his predecessors in trying to bring the description of the atomic world into line with the classical laws of Newtonian physics. In one publication, he illustrated the movement of atomic particles by means of the most popular analogy ever devised for Newtonian motion, billiard balls. Newton was the point of reference for the generations up to the time of Niels Bohr. Technological success, scientific progress, even the understanding of everyday life had grown from his laws. Influenced by his contemporary, the philosopher René Descartes, Newton had compared all moving objects in nature to the movement of cogs in a mechanical clock. Everything that moved was both the cause of a clear-cut effect and the effect of a clear-cut cause. Newton's laws provided people with a sense of security about their place in the universe. They suggested that the universe was a hard fact, independent of the human will. In a similar way, Descartes had made a definite distinction between mind and matter, and saw nature as a vast, mindless machine. Now, it's quite interesting to go a little deeper into this Cartesian... Uh, system of thought, when Descartes spoke about a machine, he very specifically meant a clockwork. You see, clocks had reached a high degree of perfection in the 17th century, and all of Europe delighted in mechanical toys, ballerinas, automata. And so Descartes, when Descartes spoke about the human body, for instance, he compared it to a clock. And he said, uh, I compare a healthy man to a well-functioning clock and a sick man to a clock which is not in perfect mechanical condition. And it's very interesting that this metaphor of the clock still dominates uh, modern scientific medicine. You see, when a clock doesn't function, when there's something wrong with a the clock, there's usually, or any other kind of machine, there's usually one specific part that is either broken or doesn't work properly. And so the watchmaker will look for that specific part will interfere and replace it, or repair it. Through the influence of Cartesian thinking, nature, whether living or dead, became unified within a single mechanistic vision of the universe. By understanding the mechanism, it was thought, nothing would be out of reach. Well, that's an interesting example. Uh, NASA, the way NASA put a man on the moon, NASA actually followed exactly the prescription given by Descartes about analytic thinking. You see, the Cartesian method of analytic thinking consists in taking a complex problem and breaking it into pieces, solving the pieces, and then putting it together again. 
Now, what did NASA do? They simulated everything in laboratories. They first circled around the Earth, then around the Earth and the Moon, then around the Moon, and then they landed. And those were all distinct steps in the Apollo program. Four forward, drift into the right level. Okay, so, Newtonian physics, or classical science, or in a broader sense, the Cartesian worldview is not wrong. You see, it's limited. It's not wrong. If you build a car, or, you know, a clock, or a sewing machine, or anything, you use implicitly the principles of Newtonian physic physics. And it's the best physics we have for mm -hmm. that domain. But if you go beyond that domain, then, uh, you know, you have to change your models and your theories. The collapse of the classical worldview began in 1900, when Max Planck proposed that the mechanical energy of an atom came into steps, and when transformed into electromagnetic energy, appeared in little packets, or quanta. More imperfections in the Newtonian scheme were revealed by experimental work on the electron, an atomic particle whose behavior refused to be predictable, causing some scientists to compare the order in nature with the probabilities in a game of roulette. Worse still, electrons appeared only sometimes to be particles. At other times, depending on the way in which you observed them, they seemed to behave like waves or shapes, describing the probability of their being found in a particular place. At the subatomic level, the common sense world of cause and effect no longer applied. The smallest teeth in the cosmic clockwork yielded no more than a probability curve. And then the next step was to ask, well, what are these probabilities of? And the big surprise was the discovery that they were not probabilities of things, but probabilities of interconnections between things. So a particle for a physicist is not a thing. It's not a small grain of sand or a billiard ball or anything like this. It's an interconnection between things. And then you ask, well, what are these things? And you find out that they are interconnections in turn. And the more you look, the more you find out that, in fact, there are no things at all in the atomic and subatomic world. Reality, physical reality, reveals itself to us in this atomic experiment as a web of interrelations, a web of relationships, a network of interconnected events. And that, I think, was very hard to accept for physicists because they were used to dealing with hard and solid things. In fact, physics, as you know, is called the hard science or the queen of the hard sciences. And that came from the classical Newtonian image of billiard balls. The world is made of hard and solid objects, the material universe. And now these objects sort of dissipated and dissolved into patterns of probabilities. One giant of the physics community who argued against a probability interpretation of the universe was Albert Einstein. God does not play dice, he said. But Niels Bohr and other physicists like Max Planck came to embrace such an interpretation. It became known as the quantum theory. In the lecture hall at the Niels Bohr Institute, the revolutionary new theory was the subject of passionate debate. Bohr gathered a circle of brilliant young scientists around himself, the elite of the 20s. Among them was the German physicist Werner Heisenberg, pictured on the right. He pondered the question of whether an atom was an object at all, or just an abstraction of our imagination. In Copenhagen, under Niels Bohr's leadership, the science of physics was acquiring new rules for understanding the natural world. According to Bohr, an atomic particle can only be described in terms of its relationship to the whole. Bohr thus introduced the concept of complementarity. If you're close enough to the individual lines of a drawing to know them in detail, you cannot be removed enough from the drawing as a whole to know what it is, and vice versa.